Emmanuel, God with us. This morning, we're going to begin by reading three scripture passages. The first is for the longing of a people in darkness who have seen a great light. And yet it will be 700 years before they see the fulfillment of that light coming. The second is the longing of Mary. And the third is the longing of Joseph. And I ask as you listen to these, let these form puzzle pieces to be a prophetic voice for the light to come into your darkness, to behold him, and to be held. The first reading, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from that time and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The second reading, Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and he shall be called, and and he shall and you shall call him his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The third reading, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this, very, in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name 
Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. We like the idea of God's king coming into power and overturning corrupt governments, whether they be uh, in Washington or Jerusalem. Unless I'm that corrupt power, that corrupt official, whether in Jerusalem, Washington, or my own family, or my own heart, my own soul, mind, and body, Emmanuel, God with us. What part of his wonderful counsel fills me with hope? And what part of his wonderful counsel do I push back? Do I close my ears that I don't want to hear? What part of my warring longs for the Prince of Peace? What part of my warring soul is not yet ready to let go of conflict? What part of me sees his judgment and justice as good news liberating me to where I am captive to forces of sin and darkness? And what part of me sees his coming judgment and justice as a thing to fear, a thing to avoid at all cost? Emmanuel, God with us. What's a safe distance? Just what is the heart of this counselor, king, and judge? Is he a loving father, only sometimes? who closes his heart when he's at work, becoming a legalistic perfectionist, laying down everlasting torment without mercy to those who displease him? Or is he a loving father, first and foremost, everlasting parental love, who longs to transform, rescue, and deliver his wayward children from their captivity to sin and death? Emmanuel, God with us, Is God truly good and loving in all God's ways? At heart, we go back to the question ringing in our ears since we first started getting spiritual advice from snakes in the garden. Is God really good? Does God really have your best interest at heart? Or is God selfishly using you to fulfill God's own interest? Does he truly love you? When asked to be shown the Father, Jesus said, to have seen him was to have seen the Father. What kind of character do you see in Jesus portrayed in the Gospels? And where does the character of Jesus as you see him portrayed in the Gospels align with your view and character of the Father? And where did they differ? And who told you they were different? How long has your heart and mind longed to be free of those lies? That to see Jesus is to see the Father, to see the character of Jesus who forgives those who nailed him to a tree, is to see the very character and heart of the Father God. Emmanuel, God with us, is the one thing, it is one thing to have the king in the capital. It is quite another to invite the king to set up his throne in the command center of your own soul. Mary, for unto us a child is born. We like the image of Mary, pregnant with the Christ child. A humble manger, shepherds and sheep. We like the idea of being visited by angels. But the actual experience of encountering the holy is so far out of our comfort zone so far out of our control, it's usually terrifying. The Spirit does not show up with a bag of nicely wrapped presents. The Spirit shows up to plant something of God in us, something divine, something that will change everything. God is humble by nature. We know this because Jesus was humble by nature. And so he chooses a humble manger Mary becomes that humble manger. Mary is pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. This isn't how pregnancies are supposed to come about for betrothed women. And she is at risk of being disbelieved and rejected by Joseph, her betrothed husband. Giving birth is frightening enough. 
But this, the Messiah, this long-awaited hope, as if raising a normal child was not difficult enough. But nevertheless, Lord, let it be done unto me according to your will. Joseph was a mensch, a person of high integrity and honor. Mary is pregnant, and the baby is not his. God reveals the truth to Joseph in a dream. Do not fear, Joseph. Here is the honorable path before you. Take Mary as your bride. Take the son as your own. But what about the people of Nazareth? No dreams, no visions to explain what was happening. No proof, just gossip, gossip, gossip. In a culture where honor rules, Joseph is humbled. Before the Lord I stand, in him and before him only will I stand or fall. Joseph will tr love, train, and raise up this child of God's as his own, no matter the cost, to his pride, to his first year of marriage, his safety, his profession. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Father, may your father's heart for your son beat in me. May the counsel I give him flow from you. As his eyes seek my face, Father, may they see yours. Emmanuel, God with us, what's a safe distance? A nation across the ocean? A city on the other side of the country? Next door? No, ground zero. In my body, in my heart, where heaven and earth become one, Emmanuel, God with us, or I can behold him, or I can be held. From the beginning of the child's life, he will be threatened by a jealous king. He will live his life loving God with all his whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. He will reveal the character of the Father in every facet of his life. He will manifest the power of God in perfect love and obedience to the Father. And in the end, this righteous man's life will be handed over to a jealous king, a corrupt judicial and religious system. And they will take his life. With the Father, by the Spirit, the Son will enter into our captivity to sin, hell, and death. He will plunder hell and break the chains of heaven from within. But neither the gospel nor the Christmas story stops here. Jesus, the last Adam, becomes a life-giving spirit. Jesus, the Messiah, is still Emmanuel. He is still God with us. With God, the Father Almighty, he rules and reigns in the transcendent heaven. By the Holy Spirit within us, his, his presence is incarnate within us. He is God with us. Like Mary, he now shares our body with us. And we share our bodies with him. Our first reaction to a close encounter of the divine kind is usually one of fear. Who can see the face of God and live? Lord, hide me in the cleft of the rock and just let me get a slice, a slice of the vision of you as you pass by. Let me see, your, let me see your, the back of your head. Depart from me, Lord, for I'm just a stupid, sinful man. Woe is me, for I am undone. When the light of Christ shines into the darkness of the pit of our prison, we see the light of truth on both sides. We see the light of Christ exalted in holiness and purity. And that light, in that light we see ourselves pretty much the very opposite. And that light reveals the corrupt state of our souls, dead and dying. But it is shining, that light is shining not with condemnation, but with the loving, merciful, forgiving, welcoming, healing gaze of the Father in the face of Christ. But fearing God is like us. We shrink back in fear. Really? Who told you God cannot look on sin? 
Well, in one sense, he can't. Not any more than light can look on darkness. A dark room, you turn on the light, the darkness disappears. God is a consuming fire. He is the Father of light in whom there is no darkness at all. God is love. God is a consuming fire of light and love. Who transforms the darkness, my darkness, and your darkness into the light of his love. God does not look on your sin. God looks on you. His beloved child, you are fully seen, you are fully known, and you are fully loved. Emmanuel, God with us, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will deliver the, his people from their sin. Maybe we should be like, more like God and stop looking at our sin. Stop identifying with it. Stop trying to be your own light. Start looking toward the face of God. But Lord, it's so hard to behold you, it's so hard to see you. Emmanuel, God with us. Let God with us be planted in you, be born in you as you are born in him, and take you on a transforming journey of love from fear to wonder to loving union. Of the increase of his government, of his rule and reign, there will be no end, for God is love. He rules and reigns in love. The journey of love is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of the Father, Son, and Spirit making their home with us. Our journey begins in Bethlehem, in the hum humble inner sanctuary, where we behold the seed of God, the Christ child, conceived by the Holy Spirit, becoming one body with you. In 1 Corinthians 3, 15 to 18, we read this concerning beholding. Yes, to this day, whatever Moses has read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And how are our faces unveiled, and what does that journey of transformation look like? To help us, help us understand this transforming journey of love, this journey of unveiling our faces, of beholding him and being transformed into that image. This journey from fear to wonder to full union with Christ. I would like to borrow from Bernard of Clairvaux's Bernard of Clairvaux's Four Loves, written in the 12th century. <laughs> loving self for self's sake. Loving self for yourself's sake. How does God love us at this stage? Well, God is love. God never loves us less than fully. We love because he first loved us. There's nothing you can do to add to his love or subtract from it. While we, while we were yet sinners, while we were in darkness, in darkness, in sin and error pining, Christ comes, the light of men, shining in the darkness. And how do we perceive the nature of God at this stage? We might not think of God existing at all. In God we live and move and have our being, and yet we can be totally unaware that there is a higher power beyond the laws of chance and nature. Most likely we see the light of Christ as anonymous wisdom and virtue. Whether named or unknown, whether named or, whether named or unknown, Christ, the Logos of God, is still the light of humankind. The light is from God. Wisdom is from God. And, it's, and it is a manifestation of God in all who walk in wisdom 
and virtue. Wherever you see people walking in wisdom and virtue, regardless of whether they are consciously following Jesus or not, name the virtue and bless it and honor them for it, for it is from God. God indeed forgives the deeds that flow from our lack of wisdom and virtue. And in love, he is determined to grow them as he grows us into the image of Christ. It will unfold in time. Who comes to mind when you think of people, particularly non-Christians, who reflect the wisdom and virtue of Christ? Would you take a minute and give God thanks They are not in competition with Christ. They have received him to some degree in virtue and wisdom, and yet they don't know it's him. So in your heart, would you bless them and determine to honor them for it by showing your appreciation in some way? Whether they are Christian or Jew or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu or secular or straight or gay or moving along an unknown spectrum of confusion, They are manifesting the rule and reign of Christ, the light of the world, whenever and wherever they are practicing wisdom and virtue. And what does transformation look like at this first stage of loving self for self's sake? Well, it's growing in wisdom and doing good to others. It is delayed gratification and self-discipline. It is moving from selfish ambition to the wisdom of raising the social tide of caring for neighbors, the tide raises all boats, and I'm not just seeking to raise my own. We die to undisciplined needs and wants, and we stop feeding insatiable appetites and addictions. We are transformed into seeing ourselves as only flourishing as we become part of a larger whole, a family, a neighbor, part of the fellowship of humanity. And how does God love us at this stage? Well, God is love. God never loves us less than fully. We love because he first loved us. There is nothing you can do to add to his love or subtract from it. And how do we perceive the nature of God at this stage of loving self for self's sake? We probably see God a lot like ourselves. I'm sorry, we moved into loving God, (laughs) loving God for self's sake. We come to see that God exists and it would be helpful, it would be wise for us because of our own fears to get with his program. So, but we probably at this age see God a lot like we see ourselves, selfish and narcissistic. I love those who can repay me. I love those who tell me how wonderful I am. And I don't love them so much who, who don't flatter me. If I believe God is like this, if I please him, I will be rewarded. If I dis- displease him, I will be punished. After all, that's how I love. We see God wanting things done his way because, well, God is God. And I would do the same if I had his power and authority at my command. Sure, God is love, but surely his love must be self-serving. Blessing those who love him back and glorify his name while forever punishing those who refuse to love him and bow the knee. Well, given the choice between heaven and hell, I bow the knee. I do say, believe, and profess whatever it takes to say on God's good side. Not that God has a bad side because I dare not say that or think that because he might punish me. I justify my beliefs about God I justify any beliefs about God that for a person I would say, that's not a good person, but it's God. And therefore I I justify what I would normally think is bad behavior in God and call it good. Like not forgiving his enemies. Like eternal conscious torment for those who refuse his love and forgiveness. Because our image of God looks so much like our own immature, selfish ideals, we become very formulaic, legalistic, and judgmental. We can become very double-minded between our heads and our hearts as legalism 
and worship battle for our affections. A veil lies over our hearts. Our love is motivated by fear and selfishness and a desire to control God to come to an arrangement where we can leverage the power of God for our own interest. On the other hand, we also love beholding the beauty, majesty, and glory of God's love, and we receive great spiritual consolation. We begin to decrease in our own eyes, and he increases. Our pleasures are becoming much more spiritual, but even worship is about how it makes me feel. I worship God because I love that spiritual consolation. So what does transformation look like at this stage? We die to trying to live life apart from God, from insisting on our own will, from trying to manipulate and bargain with God. We begin dying to our transactional understanding of the gospel as our heads begin to believe what our hearts have always known. Our view of God is much too small. The veil begins to lift and we see God a little more clearly as God truly is. He truly is like Jesus. Jesus truly is the revelation of the Father. We are transformed when we realize God is for us, that God has our best interest in mind, and that his ways are truly best, not just because God needs, wants his own way, but he's designed things to function and work in a certain way, in love, in communion, and harmony. We flourish when we walk in them, and we suffer the natural consequences when we don't. But whether flourishing or suffer, suffering, we can truly trust that God has our best interests at heart. Although we come from God with selfish motives, we come to God for selfish motives, he still meets with me. And every time I come away from God, even with my selfish, selfish motives, he's rubbing off on me. His character's rubbing off on me. I'm beholding him and being transformed little by little into his image. Loving God for God's sake. Well, how does God love us at this stage? The way God always loves us. God is love. God never loves us less than fully. We love because God first loved us. There is nothing you can do to subtract to his love or add to it. God never changes. How do we perceive the nature of God at this stage? Awe and beauty and goodness. God's love is inherently self-giving, self-pouring out, self-emptying, self-sacrificing. Kenosis. God is an infinite being of love who loves without limit, who loves unconditionally, who loves without motive or benefit to God's self. It is the nature of God to love. It is his desire to love. It is the expression, the will of God to love. And we love in return. Because there is nothing more beautiful than God who is love. Well, what does transformation look like at this stage? Our desire is simply to behold the Lord without any other benefit in return. We talk far less in prayer and we listen far more. More and more we experience the Spirit worshiping in us, praying through us, and carrying us into the deep communion of God. Where once we served others out of duty or to get something from God, it has now become an act of love and worship to the Lord. We die to the habit of trying to fill our desire for more of God with lesser loves. Even good things become to get in the way of our desire for God, and we set them aside. We are transformed as we surrender to the Spirit to take us into the love of the Father for the Son and the Son's love for the Father. We begin experiencing the Trinitarian communion from the inside. We behold him and are beheld by him. The fourth, loving self for God's sake. How does God love at this stage? As always, God is love. 
God never loves less than fully. We love because he first loved us. There's nothing we, you can do to add to his love, and there's nothing you can do to subtract from his love. How do we perceive the nature of God at this stage? By the Spirit of God within us, we perceive the Son through the heart of the Father, and the Father through the heart of the Son. We perceive ourselves not as me and you and them and God over there, but as the beloved in Christ, integral members of the union the Trinity has with all creation. We experience the reality of Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. Father, I pray they would be one as you and I are one. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is not just a truth of Scripture. It becomes a fundamental truth of our existence, of our experience. We are one. How can I not love, how can I help but love every part of the union that is Christ in me and I in him for which all creation groans to be revealed. As all things of God, this is all given as grace, given in love, by love, and for love. God delights in giving his love away, and creation delights in receiving it and giving it back to God. A never-ending dance of love. What does transformation look like at this day? We die to everything that is not rooted in the love of God. And we are transformed into the fullness of Christ. God is love. And veil your heart from any image of God that views the work of God as anything less than the manifestation of his love. To that part of you that loves self for self's sake, I invite you to meditate upon your true longing. Recognize your true desire to be like God. Not as a thing to be seized and stolen, but a gift that God offers you. Recognize the good desire to grow in knowledge and wisdom, to grow in goodness, and mostly to grow in love, to become a truly good and loving being. Recognize your true desire to be like God and call out to God, your benefactor. I cannot do this by myself. Child, you were never, ever meant to do this by yourself, to do this in your own strength. You are never meant to live apart from God's presence. If you find your path on a downward spiral into death and destruction, and your heart in the ice-cold grip of hell, call out to him. He is not far off in heaven, but there with you, God with us, perhaps unseen and unfelt, but he is a presence of self-giving love. Call to him, Lord Emmanuel, God with me, help. And for the part of you that loves God for self's sake, fear not, Fear not, fear not, the Lord is with you. God loves you. Stop judging, condemning, and trying to fix yourself. Stop hiding from the Father behind the cross. Stop hiding from the Father behind the cross. Let his judgment consume you in the fire of his love. Let the light of Christ reveal every place that needs to die and be reborn in him. God's judgment flows from his love, is for your good, is for your healing, is for your restoration. To the part of you that loves God for God's sake, know him in his oneness with the Father and the Spirit. Jesus, wonderful counselor, Everlasting Father, know him as your peace. Know him as your king. Behold God's love for you. Give God your consent to manifest his word in you, however God desires. 
to when God says, I have something to ask of you, your first response is not what, but yes, and then what? To the part of you desires to love God for self's sake, to love self for God's sake. Behold him, know him as Mary and Joseph did. Give your full consent for the Lord who has made his home in you to do his work in you, sharing your body, sharing your heart, sharing your hands, sharing your understanding. Welcome the infant Christ into all the places in your soul in need of the incarnate birth. All the facets of your soul that need your parental care to grow and mature into the fullness of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mother and father your inner child with God. Wherever you are on the journey, come to Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Come and worship with him and the whole host of heaven. Ask him to reveal his true heart to you. Look fully into his face. Whether you can see him or not, feel the radiance of his love for you and let your heart resonate with his. I see you. I hear you. I know you. I have redeemed you. I enter into your death, broken body and blood poured out. Child, you are mine, and I am yours. Come to the table with all that you are. Eat the heavenly bread. Breathe in the breath of heaven. Drink the cup. Behold the Christ born in Bethlehem. And behold the same Christ born in you. Behold him and let the Spirit transform you into the fullness of his likeness and glory. Little by little, as you behold him and are beheld. Take time in beholding God as he is. Divine love poured out for you. Capture those glimpses. Treasure them in your heart and meditate upon them and let them grow. Emmanuel, God with us, unveil our hearts that we might behold you as you truly are. Take us on the journey of love from fear and from fear into wonder, into the wonder, into the fullness of loving union. Dare to say yes Dare to say yes to love. Let it be done unto me according to your word. Jesus, the true light that shines in the darkness. On the night he was betrayed, took bread. He broke it and gave thanks. So Father, we thank you you are the giver of every good gift. Every good and perfect gift flows down from the Father of light in heaven. And we receive it with thanksgiving. It is a gift entrusted to us. And Lord, often these gifts are broken as you were broken. And we wait in darkness for the coming light to eat of you, to know you, to see you, to behold you. And he took the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant. My blood shed for you, poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So come, Remember him. Remember all the places where the Lord has already come into your darkness and revealed his light. Come and behold him. Come and cherish him. Come and receive his hug 
his kiss upon you. Come and receive his breath within you and let his blood flow through you and into those around you. An unending dance of life and love and communion. who holds us, whom we behold, and whose face we behold, the face of the Father. So, Father, we come. We come with the darkness, and we look forward to the coming light. Jesus, we receive you. Be born in us. Be born into every dark corner that desires to light, to walk in the freedom and love and restoration of God. So I invite you to believe the gospel, to embrace the presence of God with us in everything that you do. Behold him and be held by him as he upholds you in the power of his love. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to stick around. Uh, we have pizza coming. Um, this is just an informal time of table fellowship to be seen, to be known, and get a chance to see and know others. We will have a, a, a light devotional uh, to kind of spur our discussion along. But it's a time of sharing, not a time of teaching or learning but of time of, of being seen, to be held, to be hugged, uh, and to break food together. So go in the blessing and power of the Lord. Amen.